Hi, everybody. If you're standing up, get out. Or sit down, because we have my favorite train guy who only talks about trains, and that's all we invite him for, because we like trains, too. Um, please sit down and enjoy uh, the wonderful world of hacking model trains. All right, thanks. Um, I'm Eric Ruder. I, um, I'm a fan of radios and trains, and last year I did a talk on uh, wireless protocols for real trains, and um, uh, at the risk of getting pigeonholed, I'm gonna talk about model trains this year. Um, uh, gee. <laughs> so, Model trains have been around as long as real trains, and for the last 100 years or so, they've been mostly powered by electricity. And um, for most of that history, uh, trains are powered by track, uh, electricity being applied to the track, usually DC, picked up through wheels and applied to a motor, so the train speed is proportional to the voltage. Um, but about 25 years ago, the industry shifted considerably and went to a system called DCC, Digital Command Control, that allows the power and control signals to be separate, although applied still through a, a track circuit. Um, DCC works like this. Uh, it's a differential, uh, essentially polarity switching signal that goes to the, to the two rails, and the symbol is encoded using the uh, period of a square wave that's nominally 50% duty cycle. So you have, for, uh, to encode a one, you have uh, uh, 55 microseconds one way and then the other way to get a full cycle. And then with a zero, you have to have at least 90 microseconds, but you can stretch a zero out so that you get an average voltage that's higher or lower that will allow you to actually operate a DC engine on that track, but the, the harmonics tend to fry the motors. Um, to separate the two signals, you rectify uh, the track power and get DC to power whatever you're trying to power, motors, microcontrollers, whatever, and then you run the signal through a, a optocoupler of some sort to get the data stream. Um, DCC packet looks like this. There are three bytes, there's a preamble for synchronization, three bytes, two of which are information, and the third is a checksum, uh, separated by uh, zero start bits. The Packets, there are several different types of packets. Uh, the first two here are used for actual moving equipment, engines and things of that nature. Um, one is speed and direction, which is self-explanatory. Uh, a function packet is used to control lights and sound effects and that sort of thing. And then there's this other class of packet called an accessory packet that's generally used to control trackside equipment. Um, one of the principal uses of this is to control the position of a switch or turnout. So you can do that from a handheld controller, throttle controller, and then all of this equipment is configured through DCC also, so there are packets for that. So a typical wired setup, traditional setup, looks like this. You have at least one handheld throttle, um, which looks something like this, and it's either wired or um, wireless, but it connects to some kind of proprietary throttle bus that goes into a command station, which, ag which aggregates all the commands from the throttles and creates a DCC bitstream, which is essentially a circular buffer that just rotates through the commands for all the different engines and accessories. That goes to a booster, which is basically an H bridge that does the polarity switching for the track, and then you can also take that bus and run it to an accessory decoder to get both power and data. So for smaller scales, like HO, which is a very common scale, N scale, um, this is the most practical way to operate a model railroad because uh, you need to supply the power um, through some external means. Um, the scale that I model is G scale, which is about three times in scale the size of HO. So uh, in G scale, it's practical to actually put uh, lithium ion batteries inside of an engine because an engine's this big and run uh, the, the trains without any track power. And this is desirable because many of us, myself included, operate these trains outdoors where uh, keeping track clean for conductivity is uh, a challenge. Uh, but when you lose the track power, you also lose the data. So generally, these um, 
systems are controlled by wireless connections that are directly from a handheld controller to uh, the locomotive. And to give you a sense of the scale, I debated which movie to use, but this is a, a, a test of a G-scale locomotive pulling uh, a case of beer. And you can see that um, really didn't flinch. Uh, but that you can see the, the size of a beer can, and uh, some of them are seltzers, but it's the weight that matters. All right, so um, I'll go to the next slide here. There are several competing wireless systems, uh, and this has never really been standardized the way that DCC was. And there, was, there have been attempts at it, but it didn't go very far. The one I use is called AirWire, that's made by CVP. And this is the, the handheld controller here. It's pretty straightforward. There's a rotary, rotary encoder in the center, and then you press that to change direction. So what you see on the screen is the number of the engine, 3841, the speed, and then um, the arrow indicates direction. And then the yellow uh, button on the left, right by my thumb, is the accessory button. So you can hit accessory and then a number and throw a switch or turn the signal on and off or whatever you want to do. And this connects to a, a decoder that's in an engine. And this works, this particular system operates in the 900 megahertz ISM band, which is what attracted me to it as a ham. I have privileges in that band and I thought it might allow for some interesting um, reverse engineering, hacking kind of stuff, make my own components and that sort of thing. So I wanted to figure out how um, the signal is actually encoded and sent to the engines. So the first step was sort of non-destructive um, uh, look at it in GQRX or you know, some uh, software to display SDR. It's pretty clear this is a 2FSK signal. But what surprised me was that it's continuous. What I expected was that if I made some change, some control change, that it would send that change and then it would sort of be quiet until the next thing, you know, happened. Um, but this is actually a continuous signal. So I dumped some IQ samples and opened it up in Inspectrum, and this is what it looks like. And uh, this uh, packet might look familiar from uh, five minutes ago when I explained the DCC packet. So this, this handheld throttle is actually encoding a DCC bit stream and modulating it uh, as an FSK signal which seems like a, a kind of brute force way to do this, but um, that, that's what's going on here. So I want to figure out how that's uh, being encoded, what's, what's going on, so the next step is to open it up, and pretty straightforward, ignoring the gray wires there, which I'll explain in a second. Um, so it's a microcontroller, and then this Aneron R09A uh, wireless modem, and this, the R09A is based on the TICC1101, which is very common, uh, modem chip uh, package with an antenna and some filtering and, and pins matching and that sort of thing. And looking at the pinout, uh, it's essentially a lot of do not connect or no connection and then uh, power and ground and then an SPI uh, interface and then some GPIO that you can configure through the SPI interface. So to do analysis, I soldered some wires onto the four um, SPI lines and also one of the, eventually one of the GPIO lines, and then ran them out the battery uh, connector and terminated them with DuPont connectors so I could do some analysis just using a, a logic analyzer. Uh, in this case, the Soleil Logic um, 8 anal or device and then the, the associated logic software. This is the startup sequence when you first power up the device, the, the throttle. And zooming in on this, you can see each of these um, spikes is a byte. And the software decodes all of that. And essentially, uh, there's nothing going from the modem to the uh, microcontroller. It's all the microcontroller telling the modem what to do. Uh, you can export this to a CSV and then look at the, the contents. And this is essentially the uh, registers and their um, contents to configure the modem. So this allows you to configure uh, modulation, frequency, whether you're transmitting or receiving, uh, transmit power, and that kind of thing. And 
you can go through the data sheet and figure out what all these registers are. And the one that I found interesting was um, this uh, register 08, uh, hex 08, which puts the, if you set this bit, it puts the modem into asynchronous mode. So the, the great thing with the 1101, the reason it's used in so many different devices is it does all this cool packetization and um, uh, error correction and stuff. But if you put it in asynchronous mode, it essentially bypasses all of that and one of the GPO IO lines directly modulates the FSK output. So the connection is just the microcontroller uh, SPI uh, to the modem, which configures the modem, and then uh, just a bit stream that directly modulates the FSK output. And the same setup is present in the receiver. This is what would go inside of a locomotive. And there's also an anorin module there. This one has an antenna, but it's the same um, line. And so that's really just a mirror image of the transmitter. They're both in asynchronous mode, so it creates a virtual wire carrying a logic level DCC signal between the two. Um, so now that I, I know this, I can uh, create my own um, transmitters, receivers, whatever I want to do. I'm pretty happy with the off-the-shelf throttle. And as far as a motion decoder that you put in an engine, uh, they're, they're pretty robust and um, you don't want your engines running away. They're very expensive and heavy. Uh, but what I was really interested in primarily was the accessory decoder because the accessory decoders from the manufacturer are very expensive. And with, you know, six or eight dollars worth of hardware, um, you can put together an accessory decoder that will uh, control as many accessories as you want or as you have GPIO lines for. Uh, so as an example, I put together a very simple one just using a, a very old Arduino a nano or micro and a 1101 module that you can get on eBay. It's probably a clone. Uh, change the antenna to, for a more appropriate antenna. And putting these together, um, you can create either a transmitter or a receiver. And there are plenty of DCC libraries available for the Arduino uh, ecosystem because people have been building their own wired DCC components for years. So the only missing piece is to do the modem configuration. So I wrote a library that takes these four inputs and allows you to, to dynamically configure the modem um, to do either transmit or receive, transmit power if appropriate. Uh, the RF channel, uh, the manufacturer of the throttle is defined 16 channels. And then um, uh, the slave select pin. So you can put as many modems as you want also on this SPI connection and um, operate them simultaneously, provided you talk to them uh, individually. So the library is set up like this. You just set up the four parameters, instantiate the modem. Uh, you could do many modems if you wanted with different enable pins. And then you can dynamically um, start it. There are other, other things you can do, change channel, um, and that sort of thing. This is a little uh, demo contraption that I put together just to show a sample accessory decoder. And it looks like this. I have it here, but you wouldn't be able to see it because it's quite small, so I just put it up on the screen. Um, essentially, uh, the components that I showed you, and then I put four servos on it and eight open collector outputs. And these are controlled by uh, accessory numbers one through eight. You could code them to be whatever you want. And um, I was going to try to demo this live, but I just made a video instead because it will be easier to see from uh, where you're sitting. Essentially, I'm going to power this up, and then um, it'll read from the EEPROM uh, the, the last position of the servos or the last you know, binary position of those outputs. Here, I'm just hitting accessory uh, one, and then the one and three buttons um, control the accessory number one. And I'll go through a couple others here. So the, uh, excluding the battery, this is probably 10 or $12 worth of parts. And um, that would cost, to, to do that with the manufacturer's equipment, it costs you $250 for four channels. So it's, uh, it provides, um, for people in this very specific corner of this very, very specific hobby, it provides some options for um, uh, creating low-cost accessory decoders. 
And of course, you can also transmit uh, by reversing the, the process and generating a DCC bitstream, and there are libraries to do that as well. Uh, this device, which I have hooked up here, is a, um, a monitor, and this is essentially using the library and it's cycling through. Um, uh, I asked somebody to take a picture, so that may be what. <laughs> um, it's just cycling through the 16 channels uh, with some defined dwell time. And this is, uh, I was going to do a real-time demo of this, but it doesn't seem to be working. But this is uh, five different throttles set to different frequencies showing the uh, engine number, uh, direction, and speed. And we did this at a club meeting with, you know, with actually five different um, independent throttles. And all it's doing is uh, looping through this very simple uh, loop on the Arduino, and the DCC process has callback that sends limited uh, serial data to the host, and then there's a Python program running on the host to display it. But essentially, it just goes through, waits till the dwell time is over, and then switches to the next channel. And, um, and moves on. Um, I'm going to see if I can get it to work. It does seem to be. Working. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be working for some reason, but um, there's a lot of RF going on in here, maybe the problem. Um, so uh, that's that's all I have. Uh, thanks for your attention. I have some of the thank you. Um, I have these gadgets here. If you want to see them, I'll I'll be around. So be happy to show you. Yeah. No. It may be. I've never seen any. Um, uh, there's no. FCC information or anything on the on any of the equipment. So, no, no, yeah, that's a that's a good question. There are 16 frequencies, but they're yeah, they're the carrier frequencies are fixed. You can change it on the throttle, yeah, um, yeah. Well, one of the drawbacks to this type of system is it's a one to one. You know, uh, well, you're going to have one throttle and, and multiple locomotives, but you can't control one locomotive with multiple throttles because they would just step on each other. Some of the, the other systems, competing systems, are uh, mesh networks to overcome that issue. All right. I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to get off the stage. But thanks very much. <laughs>